My 20-year-old daughter, Adriana Donato, was murdered by her ex-boyfriend, James Stoneham, in August 2012. He wasn't coping with the breakup and kept calling my daughter, threatening to commit suicide. He was seeing a psychologist and told her he was thinking of harming someone. He told some of his mates he was going to kill Adriana. He even showed them the knife he used to stab her. Nobody told her. He eventually manipulated her to get in the car with him so they could talk. He took her to a park and he killed her. If somebody had told her she was in danger, she wouldn't have got in the car with him. How can we change the culture amongst men who think, if I can't have her, nobody else can? And Grace, before we get the answers, I know you were nervous about coming on tonight. I spoke to you before the show. Why is it so important to you to be here on television tonight talking about this? Because I, I want this to stop. There are so many women being murdered by their partners and ex-partners. Uh, my daughter had a whole life to live. She was trying to help James overcome the breakup. He never actually ever hurt her. He was always manipulating her, threatening to commit suicide. I want the nation to know that and I want the culture amongst our men to change. You know, women have a choice to be who they want to be. And, um, yeah, men are trying to manipulate women like Hannah Clark as well and many other women who have um, been murdered. Taryn Chawla. Grace, there's so few words, I think, that can give any comfort to a mother who has lost their child. And I want to thank you and, and applaud you on, on national television. <laughs> for the strength, the courage, uh, and the dignity and grace with which not only you've asked your question this evening, but with, it, with which you face every day. I look at you, Grace, and I see a mother not dissimilar to my own who's in the audience this evening. I see the faces of other mothers who I've met with who have lost a loved one to violence, um, to men's violence in particular. And the short answer is that I agree with you, unequivocally and without doubt. This is not a problem of women. This is not a problem that was Adriana's problem. It became the sad ending of her life because of another man's actions. And I think that for too long now, we've been at a stage where we've been reluctant in Australia to have that conversation. We've been reluctant to have the conversation that puts the blame squarely on the perpetrator. My younger sister, Nikki, I look at pictures of her. She was killed at 23. And I see in her the same woman that Adriana was, the same woman that Dr Preeti Reddy in New South Wales was, the same woman that Tara Brown or Hannah Clark. These are the names of women like you know that we know as a community after their death. But they should still be here. And they're not here because we have a problem of men in this country, and it's endemic everywhere, but in this country who believe that women, when they exercise their fundamental human rights to be free from violence, escalate their control. If they weren't physical during the relationship, in that context of separation where most women who are impacted by domestic violence homicide are killed, they exercise that control. And so we need a fundamental shift in what it means to be a man in Australia. And rather than demonising men, I look at it as an opportunity. I look at this as an opportunity for us as a nation to say, who are we and what do we stand for? And that's where all men have a responsibility to challenge the attitudes that for too long now have seen women treated as chattels, treated as property. And I... All I can do for you this evening and all I can say is that I see you, Grace. 
I hear you and I believe you and I am so sorry. T Taryn, can I ask you though, because you know, you're looking directly at Grace in the audience tonight. Your mother's over here in the front row, understandably in tears. Can you look at them and say, we as Australian men, we can fix this? We have to. We have to, Hamish. I think one of the things about Australia that has sometimes helped us is that attitude of she'll be right. Sometimes we've actually been able to make things good again. But the reality of she'll be right is that she won't be. Nine women have died under violent circumstances this year. We know the name of one of those women, Hannah Clark, this year only because the media decided to cover it on the front page. <clears throat> and had Hannah and her three children not been incinerated after one of the worst bushfire seasons on record, I wonder whether Hannah's death would have made the news that it did. And even then we saw in the news reporting that the man, whose name I will not mention, that took her life was a good man who fell from grace or an ex-NRL player. Those things are irrelevant in the context of murder. And to hear that a man who incinerated his three children was someone who had just snapped, that is doing a disservice to the facts, let alone what it says about the context in which this crime occurred. Mali, I know your dad, who was a footy player as well, he grew up in a house where there was some domestic violence. Mm. And I was surprised to learn that it had taken him a really long time to even tell you about it. Why is it so hard to talk about this stuff in Australia? Well, it comes back to being raised in the society that tells you to be a man, you can't show these kinds of emotions. I think in part he was shielding us from the trauma of it and also because he's talking about my grandfather who's passed and I think he still wanted us to see him in a particular light, which, you know, even in trauma, um, we still love a lot of our family members, which makes it so complicated as well. But I have been so incredibly proud of my father and what he's done in the last five years. And I think maybe it is part of, you know, the attitudes that you're talking about and the responsibility that men feel now to speak up and change this attitude um, is something that he's been influenced by too. He's a police officer um, and he joined the police force to one, build better relationships between the Aboriginal community and the cops, but two, um, to really act as a protector for women and children in particular. Now there's a lot of Australians, including some of you, who have been impacted really deeply by the murder of Hannah Clark uh, and her children and there's some genuinely remarkable stories in our audience tonight. Uh, Geraldine Bilston is here. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. I know you're also nervous about talking tonight. Mm. Just explain why this murder, these murders, impacted you so deeply. Um, yeah, so I um, lived for many years in an abusive relationship and I guess I've gotten um, somewhat used to reading about, hearing about, seeing um, the weekly murders of women by their current or ex-partners. Um, but for me personally, when it's something to do with a vehicle and if it's something to do with breaching an IVO, I just, those ones really um, hit me really hard because I honestly feel like it could have been me. Um, and it's, it's just by luck that I have the privilege of sitting here and telling you my story and that I'm not a name or a nameless um, statistic. And, um, and I just I feel so deeply for everybody that's lost their life as well as um, everybody that's still hurting in this, in this crisis that we're in. Um, and yeah, I'm, just, I'm really, really lucky to be here. You shared with us some audio. Yeah. Um, it's from a phone call that you made from the car. Yeah. And part of the discussion <laughs> has been about the importance of the community finally understanding mm -hmm. what it's like for women in these moments. Yeah. Um, we're going to play a very short 
snippet sure. of the audio. Uh, mm -hmm. Just take a listen. Okay, so unit three, number 49 true. What's happening? What's happening? Sorry, what's happening? You're driving in a car, are you? Okay. Yeah. Why do you think it's so important for Australia to hear? A moment like that? Um, that was a day after I left and um, I think so many people <clears throat> want to ask people like me why don't you do, why don't you just leave or why don't you just if it's that bad leave earlier and when the option is to stay and at that point I had been assaulted the day before I'd gone to the police I had an IVO in place and people want to ask those questions and pass those judgments on, on me or other victims. And when our options are leave and be faced with those situations and all I can do is wave a piece of paper that's an IVO in the air that's supposed to protect me, that's not, that's not an appropriate answer for us and there's, that's not a, an appropriate prote protection for people who are trying to just be free. And when you see a nation grappling with something like what we've all witnessed yes. with these murders recently, what, what do you want us to know, to understand, to be able to actually stop dealing with it the way we have been and actually find a way to protect women, to protect families that are in these situations? I, um, I guess what I want people to know is that... Um, that's something that I lived through and, I, and I'm very, very lucky that I did live through it and, I, and that I had the help and support that I got at that time and following on from that. And, it, and it's the privileges in my life that got me to this point and gave me my freedom. And I guess I just want people to know that everybody deserves that and everybody deserves that whether they, they are with a partner that... Um, is kind and looks after them or whether they find themselves in a, in a relationship where that is not occurring and they should have the right to choose to leave that person freely and, and if they need help then we have to find a way to help them. You've been unbelievably courageous and brave in, and determined in wanting to talk tonight so for everybody please thank Geraldine Bilston. Thank you.